funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. As a Supreme Court decision on the future of abortion hangs in the balance on the national stage, Governor Phil Murphy today signed a bill enshrining the right to abortion into state law here in New Jersey. The Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act protects the rights of individuals to access contraception, terminate a pregnancy, and to carry a pregnancy to term. While the bill faced opposition from Republicans, some advocates say it doesn't go far enough to expand access to reproductive health. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. These are now the law of the land. Supporters cheered as Governor Murphy waived the new statute codifying legal abortion as a protected constitutional right in New Jersey, independent of state Supreme Court rulings and case law, a critical protection, Murphy said, with the nation's highest court seemingly poised to restrict abortion rights. The United States Supreme Court in preparing, is preparing to take a wrecking ball to its own precedent, Roe v. Wade, and that would also demolish our case law-based foundation here in New Jersey. Neither I nor those with me today can let that happen. There has never been a more urgent moment for our movement. And right now we need leaders to step up and unapologetically defend reproductive freedom. Planned Parenthood's Alexis McGill-Jackson noted some 26 states have prepared bills to ban or restrict abortion. A small knot of protesters at the bill signing stood on the side and throughout the news conference shouted their opposition. Babies lives matter. We just here for speaking for the babies, unborn babies. Give them a chance to live. Prayer is powerful. We're praying. Governor Murphy, as a practicing Roman Catholic, said he too had reflected on the issue. My own journey and evolution on this, easy, uh, on this issue has not been easy and is one that through great reflection has landed on ultimate respect and trust for others. Respect especially for those with limited means for whom restrictions on access to reproductive health care has the most devastating effect and trust that each of us is our own best judge and advisor. The governor today also signed a companion bill which expands prescription birth control coverage required under private insurance and Medicaid from a six-month supply to 12 months, a measure that lawmakers passed easily. But as it made its way through New Jersey's legislature, the abortion proposal prompted intense debate and furious protests on both sides. Prime sponsor and former state Senator Loretta Weinberg read aloud the language that emerged from hours of negotiation. Individuals have the right to make their own decisions concerning reproduction, including the right to contraception, the right to terminate a pregnancy, and the right to carry a pregnancy to term without government interference or fear of prosecution. This law is a stripped down version of what supporters originally wanted. To get it through the legislature, they modified a mandate requiring health insurance companies to pay for abortions. That issue will now be reviewed by the Department of Banking and Insurance. A constitutional right shouldn't depend on the size of your wallet. The ACLU's Amal Sinha, while he applauds the measure, says this law will still leave some people behind and requires regulatory fixes to improve access and equity. Because there are going to be tons of people in New Jersey that still uh, remain 
uh, unable to access abortion because they simply can't afford it, either because they're uninsured or because they uh, can't afford the copay. Sinha said these and other issues removed for expediency from the abortion rights bill, like allowing medical providers besides doctors to perform abortions, will certainly come up again for debate. And the new Senate president announced he welcomes those discussions. You know where I stand on this issue, and if you need me, I'll be there. In Teaneck, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. President Biden announced today that New Jersey is one of six states where military medical personnel will deploy to assist hard-hit hospitals. 23 medical workers are headed to University Hospital in Newark amid high COVID patient counts and staff shortages. Early in the pandemic, Army reservists deployed there to assist staff as the hospital faced the initial wave of the virus. Hospitalizations, which have been rising over the past few months, dropped overnight to under. 6,000. But those numbers are expected to peak at 8,000 within a few weeks. The state reported more than 20,000 cases and 117 new deaths. To address the nationwide surge in cases, Biden also said next week the administration will announce a plan to make high quality masks available for free and is ordering another 500 million tests that Americans can get shipped to their homes, adding up to a billion total. A website to order the tests is expected to roll out next week. And Newark is in waiting for the president's help, but taking matters into their own hands, joining several cities around the country, including New York City, and requiring proof of vaccination to enter most public establishments. Mayor Roz Baraka signed an executive order in December, and the requirement went into effect this week. The mandate is believed to be the first for a municipality in New Jersey. This comes after the mayor reinstated an indoor mask mandate in all public facilities amid the surge of COVID-19 cases. Melissa Rose Cooper spoke with local business owners and residents to see how the community is reacting. Customers lining up inside downtown Newark's Black Swan Espresso are going to have to show proof they're vaccinated before enjoying their morning cup of joe. I think like everywhere should have like some type of vaccine or uh, proof of vaccination because like then you know you're around other people who have uh, you know gotten their shots and you know even though it's still not like an iron wall of defense you do feel safer knowing that other people are vaccinated. It's part of a new citywide mandate that went into effect Monday. It requires people five and over to get at least one dose of the vaccine in order to enter most public establishments like gyms, movie theaters and restaurants. And three weeks from now, you'll need to be fully vaccinated in order to enter those businesses. So far, it hasn't been too bad. Adam Burgo owns Black Swan Espresso. He thinks the mandate is a good idea and doesn't expect a lot of people will have a problem with it. Just like when they first started the mask mandates, uh, I think a lot of people thought there was going to be issues with that, but uh, it didn't seem like anyone had a problem keeping their mask on when coming into the establishment. So same with this uh, for dining in and sitting in. One of Burgle's customers, Justice Pitt, who also owns a small business nearby, agrees. It keeps everyone safe. It keeps the business running. Um, as a small business owner in downtown Newark, you know, I think that it's important to keep, you know, the local economy, you know, afloat, running, um, and everybody safe. So I appreciate it and respect it. But not all businesses feel the same. A restaurant owner from the Ironbound, who didn't want to be identified, told us while Newark residents may follow the rules, people from other cities who travel to Newark will either give businesses a hard time or choose to go elsewhere, leading to lost revenue. It's not just unfair to them. The the COVID has been unfair to, to the entire world. Newark Mayor Ras Baraka is standing by his decision to enforce the proof of vaccination mandate, especially as the city continues to see a high number of COVID cases. As of January 12th, there were 656 new cases, bringing the total in the city to over 71,000. So the decisions I make are not based on, you know, whether somebody is going to have one luxury over another. It's, it's, it's based on whether uh, we're going to be able to slow this thing down so misery is not spread all over the, the, the city. And, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, while, while it's not a, an ideal situation for businesses at all, and I think it's, it's difficult for them, I think it's better than us shutting it down. They experience being shut down. They know how it feels, what it means. I think that uh, this gives them an opportunity to at least stay open and do the things that they need to do. And plus, you know, 86 percent of the people in Newark have at least one shot and 90 percent of the people in the county have at least one shot. So all of those folks are still eligible to come to those businesses, um, you know, now. 
Uh, so I, I think they have a great opportunity still to, to thrive. Proof of vaccination mandates are already in place in a number of other cities, including just over the bridge in New York. But in nearby Jersey City, Mayor Stephen Fulop says he thinks it's better to focus on the importance of getting vaccinated and tested. Since the pandemic, Jersey City has been at the forefront of testing, of vaccination policies, of taking kind of responsible restrictions. At this stage of the pandemic, two years into it, we're totally in a different phase with regards to what people know, what we're aware of, how people interact with it. And uh, the one guiding factor that we've learned over the last two years is that a patchwork of laws, municipality by municipality, that is entirely different, doesn't help anybody. And when you compare our statistics today to any of those municipalities that have those quote unquote restrictions, we're very much the same as they are. So from my standpoint, we want to be consistent with the governor, we want to be consistent with the state, and we want to have one uniform policy that people understand and can follow. Right now, the proof of vaccination mandate in Newark will remain in effect through February 1st. The city will then review it and decide whether it should continue based on its progress. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. New school quarantine guidelines came out late yesterday. The Department of Health cutting recommended isolation and quarantine periods for students and school staff to five days from 10. Health officials recommended isolation for people who are sick or who have tested positive for COVID-19 and quarantines for those who have been exposed. The change follows the CDC recommending shorter quarantine and isolation times earlier this month altering the guidelines to when a person is most contagious, followed by another five days of masking. This news comes as the Patterson School District extends its remote learning plans by at least another week. Students in the state's third largest district will now return to class in person on the 24th. About one quarter of all schools in the state are remote this week, with parents in other districts like Edison calling for their schools to offer virtual learning for students. The American Red Cross has declared its first ever national blood crisis, warning that if donations don't increase soon, life-saving blood may not be available to people who need it. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused a decline in donor turnout, the cancellation of blood drives and staffing challenges. The historic shortage is the worst in more than a decade, and doctors are now forced to make tough decisions on who should get blood and who needs to wait. Joanna Gagas reports. We have a 10% decline in the amount of people who are donating blood overall through the pandemic. Um, but right now, this crisis is the worst that we've seen in a decade. The lack of blood supply creating this crisis means that patients who depend on life-saving blood transfusions may not be able to get them. Patients like Ruth Ann Burns, who was diagnosed with an aggressive blood cancer. And I was going three times a week, um, either for platelets or for a blood transfusion. And finally, um, the blood shortage hit really hard, um, probably in the fall. And um, it was taking more than a day or two to get my blood. Making things harder for Burns, her blood type is A negative. Which less than 6% of the population um, in our country is A negative. So it made it even harder for me to get the blood. Healthcare systems around the state are operating at half to even a quarter of the supply they're used to. And in the last two weeks, the Red Cross has seen a drop even lower. We've had less than a one day supply of blood on the shelves. And ideally we like to have a five day supply. The situation is really quite dire. Blood banks in hospitals operationally are used to having a certain minimum inventory. And based on that inventory, they are able to plan um, everything from surgeries to the unknown. The unknown being accidents that could happen to any of us at any time. Not just automobile accidents um, or a disaster situation, but somebody who starts to bleed when they're in the OR or somebody that comes in to the emergency room with an internal bleed and needs to be immediately taken to the OR. So in order to make sure that there is product available for them, routine procedures and routine transfusions are being delayed. Leaving physicians to make excruciating decisions about who gets care and who doesn't. When Burns found herself without the needed blood supply, she decided to take action. I reached out to my network at Rutgers University and asked them for help and explained the situation. And um, 
I was able to get about 13 people to donate blood. And um, that was amazing. And to me, each one of those people are heroes because if I didn't get that blood, my platelets were so low um, and my white count was so low that, um, you know, I would have been in real trouble. Today, this group of heroes in Montclair rolled up their sleeves to help, each one potentially saving up to three lives. I heard about the donation crisis with the blood banks and everything, so I was like, you know what, if I can get an appointment today, it'd be perfect. I'm a regular blood donor. Uh, I started actually when the pandemic started because it was something, like, like a lot of people, I wanted to do something helpful. I gave a Power Red unit uh, donation today. The Power Red is where you actually give two units of blood. Rest assured, we are taking all of the safety precautions that we need to to make sure our donors and staff are safe. Blood cannot be manufactured. We cannot staff pilot. Um, it can only come from uh, donations from volunteers, so we appreciate everyone who comes out. I'm hopeful that the American public will come out and be very generous. And a little fun fact, just by showing up to donate blood, you'll be registered to win two Super Bowl tickets. You can go to redcrossblood.org or through the Red Cross Blood app where you can actually see what hospital your blood went to. In Montclair, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. New footage related to a fatal police shooting in Patterson was released yesterday by the state attorney general's office. Patterson police allegedly shot and killed Thelonious McKnight, a 25-year-old black man, on the night of December 29th. Since then, McKnight's family and friends, along with community members, have demanded answers from authorities on what happened. State investigators say at least two guns were fired during the incident and a handgun was recovered near McKnight's body. But McKnight's family family has said they don't believe he was armed that night. The newly released videos, which include footage from a police body camera, surveillance cameras, and a video posted to Facebook, do not show the shooting itself, just the moments before and after. The only footage from a police body camera is from an officer who arrived after the shooting to assist with first aid. More than 60% of police officers in Patterson do not wear body cameras, according to NorthJersey.com, despite a law requiring that all uniformed officers in the state do so. Millions of dollars in rent relief is on the way for those who are still struggling to make ends meet due to the pandemic. Rhonda Schaffler has the details and all the other top business headlines of the day. Rhonda? Raven, relief is on the way for more New Jersey residents struggling to pay the rent. The state has received an additional $42.7 million in federal funds for rent relief and those funds will be distributed to households on the waiting list for state rental assistance. Meantime, the state is urging tenants at risk of eviction to fill out the eviction protection self-certification form offered by the state. The Department of Community Affairs says to date, it's distributed more than $500 million in emergency rental assistance to more than 58,000 households. More than 2,000 student loan borrowers in New Jersey will receive funds from a settlement between the state and the student loan processing company Navient, which used to be called Sally May. New Jersey was one of 39 states that sued the company for deceptive practices, including misleading borrowers about past due amounts and not working out payment plans that benefited the borrower. Navient has agreed to pay millions in restitution to borrowers across the country in New Jersey and elsewhere. Those borrowers will receive about $260. Navient, which did not admit any wrongdoing as part of the settlement, is also required to cancel $1.7 billion in private student loan debts. More people than expected filed new unemployment claims in the latest week, and economists are blaming the recent surge in COVID cases. Economists say the uptick in cases led to layoffs, but they expect that's only temporary. Get ready for a potentially frustrating tax season. The IRS announced this week that it too has staffing shortages and it's faced with a backlog of returns from last year. Andrea Diaz of SKC and Co CPAs explains how that may impact you. Processing times may take a little longer. It may take a little longer for to receive refunds, um, and it may take a little longer to receive any notifications regarding your tax return. So we should just uh, hang tight. Know that this is coming. Know that we have 
uh, some delays. The IRS is encouraging people to file their returns electronically. You can start to do that as of the 24th of this month. And this year, the tax filing deadline is extended to April 18th. Here's a look now at how the stock market closed today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. And make sure you tune into NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. This weekend, Rhonda focuses on your personal finance, from growing your savings to managing debt and planning for your retirement. Check it out on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel Saturdays at 10 a.m. A controversial plan to build a new natural gas power plant in Newark is on pause after heavy opposition from community groups and environmental activists. The Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission, which processes hundreds of millions of gallons of wastewater each day from dozens of North Jersey cities and towns, has been moving to build the power plant as a source of emergency power for its facility. Opponents have urged the utility to find another source of backup power rather than add another source of pollution to a neighborhood that already has plenty. The PVSC board had been scheduled to vote today on approving a contract to begin work on the project, but that was postponed at the request of Governor Murphy. A spokeswoman for Murphy said the pause will allow the project to undergo a more thorough environmental justice review and robust public engagement process, ensuring that the voices of the community are heard. More than 1.3 million New Jerseyans live in so-called food deserts, places where regular access to healthy food is hindered by the absence of supermarkets, poor public transit, low internet use, and high poverty rates. That's according to a new analysis by the state's Economic Development Authority. The agency issued the state's first ranking of 50 communities that it says have the biggest challenges to food supply for its residents. Our contributing writer, John Hurdo, joins me to explain why healthy choices are hard to find in some parts of the state as part of our ongoing series, Hunger in New Jersey. So, John, what communities are most deprived by lack of supermarkets? Uh, well, according to the Economic Development Authority, uh, they, uh, they've just published a ranking of uh, 50 of the most deprived uh, so-called food deserts in the state. Uh, and, the, and the worst uh, affected ones are parts of Camden, also Atlantic City, uh, parts of Newark and Patterson. Wow. And, and what factors is that ranking based on? Uh, well, the traditional definition of a food desert is simply a place without a supermarket with uh, where people uh, have trouble getting uh, a full range of healthy food. But now the EDA has produced uh, a much broader definition that uh, includes a whole lot of other factors that uh, that limit people's access to proper food. And those include uh, the local poverty rate, uh, internet access, um, and uh, things like that. You mentioned another factor is food swamps. Can you explain what food swamps are and why they play a critical role in the ranking? Well, a food swamp uh, is an area where there may be plenty of access to, uh, to fast food or convenience stores or places that, uh, that uh, uh, do not supply uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and other kinds of healthy food. Um, and so, of course, they, uh, the, the existence of, these, uh, of those neighborhoods uh, uh, detracts from the goals that the EDA has here of, uh, of, of ensuring that, uh, that everybody has, um, uh, everybody has uh, good local access to healthy food. Those establishments would contribute to the, the EDA's uh, uh, definition of a uh, so-called food swamp. You know, in your reporting, you mentioned impediments for some SNAP recipients. Can you elaborate a little more on that issue? Some retailers do not accept online orders uh, for, uh, uh, from, uh, from SNAP recipients. Uh, and so one of the, the focuses of this current campaign is to persuade uh, is to persuade food, food retailers who, who supply uh, folks who are, who are in, uh, in receipt of SNAP coupons uh, to accept 
those uh, to accept online orders. And of course, that will recognize uh, that this uh, this massive shift in uh, consumer behavior that we've seen towards online shopping. And what is your biggest takeaway from this ranking? Well, I think it's simply the large number of people who are affected by this. Uh, according to the EDA, uh, 1.32 million New, New Jerseyans uh, live in these so-called food deserts, and uh, and and that um, exacerbates the uh, the uh, uh, the existing problems with food insecurity, uh, which have been worsened by the pandemic. John Hurdle, excellent reporting on breaking down food deserts. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. That does it for us tonight, but you can catch up on the week's top political headlines tomorrow morning on Reporters Roundtable with senior political correspondent David Cruz. This week, David talks with Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter about the state of the state and the top priorities of the New Jersey Legislative Black Caucus in this new legislative session. That's tomorrow at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. I'm Raven Santana. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, the PSEG Foundation, and by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ. Funding for Hunger in New Jersey has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health that provides everyone in America a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being. The Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Ocean Wind, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.